Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to um, Hands On History Thursday. This is Plugged Into History with Middleton Place Foundation, and we're just so glad that you all can be here with us today. We know that this is not only a crazy time in our lives due to coronavirus, but it's also probably a little bit busy, although different from your normal spring holiday weeks that you all might be experiencing. And we're just so glad that you are able to take a few moments to uh, take a time out and watch some interesting and hopefully educational content here from Middleton Place. Um, we have a lot of great information today from Rakina Bowen, manager of the House Museum here at Middleton Place and her mom, Carol, who is here as a registered silver polisher for Middleton Place Foundation. So they're going to give you some historic and some contemporary information today about polishing silver, silver plate, some other things that you can use in your life, maybe, if you happen to be in the space where um, you are able and ready to do some home projects. So they'll talk more about that, but we're just grateful that you're here that you're able to spend some time with us and, and enjoy our mission of bringing the past uh, to the people and connecting you with history. So I will stop being the disembodied voice behind the camera and let Rakina take it away. All right. The idea behind this um, uh, project that we're going to do stemmed from, uh, and this is probably one of the most asked questions that we get when we are open for, for tours, that everybody goes, oh my gosh, the silver's so beautiful. How do you keep it so so shiny? And the very, very short answer is we polish it. <laughs> but we're going to show you the much longer answer of how it, it is that we do care for the silver. Um, going back in history, of course, the enslaved uh, people, the house uh, slaves and servants would have been the ones that would have been in charge of polishing the silver, maybe being overseen by a, a highly trusted house servant or maybe even uh, the lady of the house, making sure that the uh, polishing was being done correctly. And of course, in the in that, those times, they did not have commercially um, produced uh, silver polish like what we use today. They would have been uh, concentrating on things that they did have. Um, a couple of these are mildly abrasive. The, the rotten stone is actually a, a porous rock that's been uh, made into a powder. And it could be mixed with the sweet oil or some water and uh, mildly abrasive to clean that silver. Um, heart's horn is another one. This is actually uh, ground up um, deer horn that would have been used again as a, as a, as a product to help uh, be mildly abrasive to clean the silver. Um, actually, uh, Henry Augustus Middleton Jr.'s um, law, uh, journal indicates it has a, a, like a shopping list, and uh, rotten stone and hearts, <laughs> hearts horn was um, on that list, and possibly used medicinally or even as for polishing the silver. Um, jumping up to uh, how we care for the silver today, probably the most important thing that we do. Um, besides polishing it. There are some uh, museum professionals that don't like the idea of polishing silver. So if you have been to other institutions, other museums, and you see silver that's not uh, polished, it's not that they're being neglectful. It's their, um, their curators, their higher ups that have decided they didn't um, feel that it was something that was necessary uh, and as far as preserving the silver, because you may already know when you polish silver, you're actually removing some of that silver. So you do try not to do it that often. And one of the uh, things that we use to not knock down as often as having to polish the silver, um, I would say probably each piece gets done maybe about twice a year, wouldn't yeah. you say, Carol? Um, we use what's um, called Pacific Silver Cloth. And all of the silver in the house is covered each night um, when we're closed, and now they are, it's it's closed. Yeah, you know, we're closed now. So everything, all the silver is being constantly kept covered by the Pacific silver cloth. What's interesting about this cloth is it is embedded with uh, thousands of fine silver particles, and the tarnish that can come to the silver is actually attracted to the cloth instead of settling on the silver piece itself. You don't wash the Pacific Silver Cloth. Um, if it gets a little dusty or whatever, you might shake it out. 
I've even uh, put it in on the air fluff in the dryer to help remove some of those particles. So it's, we're not putting dust back onto the, the silver. Rikina, is that yes. something that folks can purchase for themselves somewhere? You certainly can. You can hop online, Google uh, Pacific Silver Cloth. Um, it will give you some more information about the cloth itself, and uh, I think Amazon or, or might even be one of the places that you can uh, purchase it. So it's very readily available. It's not cheap. It's about twenty-four or five dollars a yard. All right. So maybe that's a maybe that's a purchase to come when. Uh, the economy is more stable, yes. but but it is available. You can find it. That's not one of those special museum tools right. that only curators have access to. Right. Um, so I'm going to turn some of this over to Carol. She's going to demonstrate some of the things that we do. Oh. Now, when it does come time to polish the silver, the first thing we do is actually we wash it. We use distilled water. You can see the, the water in the bottom there. And it's not very soapy. It's just very light. Now, this is something that is archival. Yes. The um, the Gaylord archival. Um, it, we use it as a as a as a as a wash, but I think it's, it does many other things yes. as well. Sometimes when our objects are a little bit yellowish, just washing them will bring that back up to its nice natural shine, and they do not need to be polished after that, which saves on getting uh, removing any of the polish or any, any of the, the silver. Thing. So we just use a cl soft cloth, dampen. The f it's just regular flannel that you can get at your local um, fabric store. I have a favorite pa fabric store, but I won't give them a plug today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there an alternative soap for those who can't get the Gaylord Archival? I mean, Dawn is soft enough to work on animals, right? Is that something that we should steer clear of? For yeah, I, I, wouldn't use, I wouldn't use that. that any any no. detergent, no. Um, and this is very low uh, sudsing. Sure. Yeah. So probably, probably not. And now there's also distilled water in the little spray bottle. And I am rinsing the soap off with the spray. This also helps remove any residue of silver polish that may be hiding out in any of the little nooks and crannies. As you can see, this has quite a few nooks <laughs> and crannies. What is it that you're working on here today, Carol? This is a wine bottle coaster. This is the bottom, which we do not wash. It's made out of wood, so we don't put that into any water right now. So now that this is all completely wet, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to dry it slightly. Let me sit down. Okay. And you notice I am not rubbing. I'm just tapping very carefully. And you notice I am wearing gloves. Thank you. I had meant to mention that. Um, all of the silver uh, and metal and things like that in the house, we uh, wear gloves, either white cotton gloves or the latex gloves. Um, you're, you're ready to do the uh, polishing now? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Again, this is just a commercially uh, bought uh, Goddard's. It's a paste. There's um, not very there's much not left. Much in there, no, no. But it is a paste. It, 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 Let me it, take a look at that bottle. Then. It looks like um, clay. Yeah, it looks like kind of like like almost almost like red clay from the upstate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but we don't leave it just as a as a paste. We then put it in a bowl, and it's been watered down again with distilled water until it's it's a slurry. It's been well watered down. So we got a question. What about something like ivory liquid, or would that still be too sudsy? If they have a low sudsing version of it, that might work. Yeah. Okay. Either that or just maybe at least a rinse in distilled water okay. with no... Just to take the dust and things off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're getting ready to polish it anyway, I'm, I'm sure it's a step that could, for your home use, could be, could be actually could be skipped. Now yeah. I'm ready to start doing polishing. First of all, I need to establish a beginning spot. Uh, a lot of our objects do not have any markings on them that I can, can can establish that that's where I started and that's where I need to end. So sometimes things get polished 
twice without realizing it. But this has our uh, Middleton shield here on engraved. So that's where I'm going to start. I am using a, this is a medical um, Q-tip with a longer handle, it's easier to get into. And I do need to mention this whole process um, was uh, taught to us, several of us, um, by our curator. Um, this is, I, I, I'm not sure how, if she learned this or if she, or if she developed it herself. Well, I'll have to ask her that because I don't know. Has okay. she said to you? I don't know if she's... I don't recall that she said anything is, about yeah. how she uh, developed or learned this process. So I have dipped my Q-tip into, for want of another word, it's not Q-tip. Uh, and then I'm going to come over to the surface and apply this. And so would a, would a home Q-tip work in place of these? Yes. I, I have used them in my home, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the reasons um, our curator wants the medical Q-tips, um, you're able to put less pressure on yes. because it has the long wooden you, stick. Okay, do you see when, when it, it, it was just brown when I started, but and now we have the tarnish, the tarnish has uh, adhered itself to the the cotton so i'm done with that then it needs to be rinsed we do not want this to dry and so i'm taking just plain distilled water and going over the spot that i just put the polish on and so that's your other bowl is that's plain my other bowl distilled is water. just plain distilled water and here again i am picking up some of the dirt or the tarnish and when it comes out clean it's clean so folks if you're just joining us we are here with um, Carol and Rakina house manager and one of our certified silver polishers they were just talking about how not anybody who works here at Middleton Place can pick up silver and polish it our curator has a very specific process and a training program for the folks that uh, polish the silver. So, um, and if you're concerned about social distancing, I do want to mention that Carol and Regina are mom and daughter, so don't worry, we are being safe. This is immediate family members here. Um, and so we've got two of the same question, which is great. How long, Carol and Regina, would it take to polish a piece like this? Well, I'll probably spend the next two hours, at least on this. Uh, some of the more intricate and larger pieces can take two days. Of you know, We don't polish eight hours a day because we would be cross-eyed by the time the day was done. So we break it up into maybe a four or five hour segment and sometimes some of the, as I said, the more intricate and larger pieces will take up to two days, 10, 12 hours of polishing. And so after you polish with the polish and rinse with the distilled water, what's the process? Um, then probably a soft, the soft cloth, the flannel again, um, to uh, dry it off. Um, make sure it's, it's uh, good and dry because you don't want it to uh, be, be wet or damp. Um, dry is much better for the silver. So you want to make sure you get it completely dry and then it'll be ready to go back on display. <laughs> so we have a couple more questions. Um, how often, can, if you could repeat, how often each piece gets done? We do have a, a, a paper log. We write down um, who has polished uh, which piece. We have a, it's, it's about four pages, I believe, of, of silver that we write down who polished it and um, the date. And we use that date to know when it's time to uh, polish something again. Each piece gets done about twice a year. Sometimes uh, some objects seem to be in a place where they seem to take on that yellowish look uh, a lot faster than other pieces. And they, again, can be just washed and put back on display until it is time to actually do the polishing. Great. I and have in these last few minutes I have done from here to here and all this fretwork in here. I will probably do the the
crown here, the fretwork here, and, and I will save the bottom until the very last, but I will do everything above. And when I get done with this and all the way around, then I will do that. I also like to go to the inside because the inside is silver also. So that needs to be polished up and, and any tarnished removed from that. So this, this, this tiny portion is done and however long that took, I didn't time it. And how many uh, cotton tip applicators did you use on that tiny oh, one, portion? One, two, three, four, five, seven. <laughs> and I, I use a lot of the applicators. Um, we have, these are just cosmetic applicators that with a fine point can get into little tiny places such as this. I don't use these a lot, uh, but they are available and they do have two ends. Yes, <laughs> so, and you can, yeah, those are just your local beauty supplies. Yeah, you can get them, well, I think even at drug stores they will have those. I, and any, you know, um, applicator that you use for makeup. Sometimes we will get into tiny, tiny little places with the common ordinary household toothpick. And, and again, very gently. Very, very gently just poke. And, and I mean, don't, don't rub, don't do anything. Just kind of go over it and the little tip will maybe have a little bit of, of that polish on it. But that's very, very carefully. We do not try to use these. You could wrap this in cotton, but it really defeats the purpose of getting into the tiny, tiny places. So those are just two of the other things that we could use for the polishing. We have a couple more questions. One being, um, do we know how many pieces of silver the museum has? <laughs> I haven't counted. No. <laughs> there is silver in every room I believe I take that back I don't think there's any silver in the library um, there is yeah, there's brass there's brass in the library oh and speaking of brass there is a completely different process that we use for um, cleaning the brass that uh, that too is probably about twice a year that the brass gets yeah. done um, we have brass candlesticks and brass doorknobs and those kind of things and we have um, again a, a different commercially made um, product that we use to uh, clean that that metal. Um, all right, thank you. So if distilled, a lot. <laughs> yeah, short answer. A so lot. a lot. <laughs> if distilled water is not available, can a person use water that has been boiled five for five minutes? Um, I think it's more about the chemicals and things. Like mm -hmm. if you use tap water, there you know the, the, your your uh, area has put in all sorts of chemicals in your tap water, uh, fluoride and and chlorine and all those other things so and even even well water I would stay away from just because it also has metals and, 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 um, and, and iron comes to mind um, in in that uh, water so distilled yeah it's got to be distilled <laughs> okay and um, if you can really quickly go over the Pacific silver cloth again I think yeah. it wasn't um, understood. So the question is, do the pieces out in the air, like on the dining room table, tarnish more than the pieces that are behind glass or in cases? No, that's why the things that are out on that the table, if we were to go look in the dining room right now, you'd see all eight candlesticks. Um, there's four silver serving dishes and the apron in the middle of the table. Those are all covered um, nightly and when we're closed. Um, and this is the, again, the Pacific silver cloth, and it has um, anti-tarnish tarnishing ability. It has basically uh, thousands of fine little uh, particles of silver in it. So each of those pieces that are out are covered. The candlesticks, we actually, I don't, I don't have a candlestick one, we actually uh, manufactured and, and sewed a hole into it so we don't have to remove the candle to cover the candlestick. It just goes down on top of the, uh, the, the, uh, the candlestick with the, can the candle sticking out. So it's, a, it's an odd sight actually having all these candles sticking up out of the covered uh, silver candlestick. Um, so yeah, the, 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 one of the reasons that we have this is because so many things are out and not behind glass. And the you, things that are behind glass do not have those covers. They are simply have, behind they, glass. They're, yeah, they're behind the glass. Got it. I'm taking uh, just a piece of flannel and drying this off ever so gently. Again, not rubbing, just dabbing. Okay, I've, I've done this little bit. 
And I think you can see the difference between here and here. This is much shinier. Shinier, and this is just and I, ever I, so slightly yellow. I, I see just that little tilted. tinge of yellow. Can you tilt it? Tilt it. Tilt it. Tilt it. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it does show. It does. I, I like doing things that shows the uh, progress of completion here. Absolutely. Um, so we're getting some questions. Uh, we do know how the silver would have been polished in the 18th um, or early 19th century. Rikina did mention some products that we have here on the table, so we'll go and zoom over to those again while um, Carol works. And we also have a question, can you tell us about the product for the brass? Um, I can, if I can think of the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's out of my mind also. It's a metal polish. And I've, I've ordered that online as well. Um, so that's not anything that you can't... Well, while well, you're focusing on that. <laughs> so um, what Rakina told us about the historic way to do this is that enslaved workers would have mixed either rotten stone or the heart's horn, which are alternatively ground up um, stone or ground up deer horn uh, with the sweet oil in order to polish. And both the rotten stone and the heart's horn are slightly abrasive. Um, interestingly enough, if you're wondering who might have been polishing this silver, of course, enslaved workers in the 18th and 19th century would have been polishing, but do we have any record about that on the uh, lists of the enslaved workers we have here? Um, we have several that are listed as house servants. Um, Jenny was actually labeled a washer. Um, Mary was a pastry chef. Um, ben was a hairdresser, so we have some specific jobs that, that those did, but I have not seen anything that says silver polisher. All right, there you go. <laughs> and the metal polish is Maz. Maz for the, metal what, polish. That's what we use for the brass. Probably also available online. Yes, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I ordered that from Amazon. There you go. <laughs> Let's see, I'm gonna look through the, how do you stir it? We talked about that. Okay, I think I've gotten all of our questions so far. I'm gonna give it another moment. Is our climate a cause for faster tarnishing here in the low country? Um, that's a good question. Do you happen to? We're air conditioned. Uh, you know, so we, we, a lot of our homes are, of course, are air conditioned so that the silver is in a, a controlled climate yeah. as far as that goes. And, and maybe in the olden days, of course, there, there wasn't air conditioning and it was exposed to the elements, the hot heat and humidity. I also know, just from my own uh, household, um, if you have gas heat, because I, I used to live in a house that had gas heat, and my silver would tarnish very quickly. Um, so there's obviously something with gas heat that, that puts out something into the air that makes the silver tarnish, because I moved into a house that has electric heat, and that, that silver does not tarnish nearly as quickly. So um, I'm sure that some, some environmental things like that um, is, you know, with, within a house, but that's another thing that we do um, besides covering it, we are we try to keep the house climate controlled we keep it between 68 and 70 degrees all year round in the house we keep the sun out as much as possible any of the window all the windows have uv uh, filters uh, put on the glass um, we and we also if when it gets really humid in the summer we have dehumidifiers so all that to keep the humidity at a constant or attempting to keep it at a constant level um, all the time so you don't have great fluctuations that that's what can be bad for any antique whether it's silver or if it's a uh, piece of wood furniture it's it's you want to keep it level as much as possible and we do have people when we are open coming through the house and bringing in heat and humidity with them. Yeah, they're they're just breathing and just yeah, yeah just breathing in and and whatever may be clinging pollen, <laughs> they may be clinging to Pollen's their clothing. Really bad right now. And and so uh, that that's another reason to cover at night so that whatever is lingering in the air does not settle on the. Good. Right. And so were there silversmiths in the Charleston area or were most per uh, pieces purchased overseas? 
um, or from northern cities. Okay, most of the silver that we have um, in the museum is English sterling silver, but we do have um, at least two pieces that are Charleston silver. Um, there was a silver silversmith in Charleston, John Ewan, and we have a large pea, uh, water pitcher that he made, and that acts, that uh, water pitcher I think actually traveled to New York City not that long ago, maybe about five or so years, years ago, ago. Yeah. for the uh, New York um, Antique Symposium. So that that was really cool that it got okay. to travel there and it got seen by a lot of people. Um, initially, locally made silver was considered inferior or um, not as sought after as the English sterling silver. So there's not as many pieces of the Charleston silver as there are the English sterling silver. But over time, of course, since there are fewer pieces of Charleston silver, those are no more valuable than because there's just you know, the sheer number. <laughs> the water pitcher was a bride's gift before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. After the Civil War, unfortunately, yeah. the brides did not receive such beautiful things. Extravagant for, gifts. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe a bone letter opener or something like that, more practical yeah. than a silver water right. pitcher. Do you have a question? Um, do you also look after the silver at the Edmonston Alston House? I do. Oops, hey. I just flipped that camera right to myself. Uh, Sorry about the selfie, folks. Hi. Sorry about that. Hey, that was me up close and personal. Apologies. So, about the silver at the EA House. No, they have their own collections care uh, person there, and they uh, are the ones uh, doing downtown. Um, years and years ago, uh, my, my predecessor as the collections care person, she was in charge of both here and downtown, but that was probably 30 years ago probably. Yeah. <laughs> but we do have the same curator, so the same yes. certification and silver polishing process applies. Yes. Yeah. Um, is the Middleton Crest on all the silver? No. There's just a few things. There's a few things that have the, the crest on it. Um, Arthur Middleton's initials appear on the candlesticks along with the, uh, what is it? The coat of arms. Yeah, the coat of arms. The coat of arms is uh, on several things and, and most. most of the things um, I think this is very unusual that it does have the crest on it some of the newer pieces that we should well, say newer, newer. <laughs> new to us but quite old uh, pieces that we acquired within the last few years do have the crest on it and so um, Digital Middleton Place, thank you so much, Sabrina. She has found the Moss Metal Polish and put a link in your, um, <laughs> in the comments here for the product. So I'm going to look back at the modern products that Carol and Rakina are using now for the silver so that if you guys want to Google those. Um, the Goddard's is a commercial product. The Gaylord is an archival product, so you might not necessarily be able to find that. Um, but the Goddard's, which is the slurry that Carol is using with wa uh, distilled water, um, that is a commercially available product. And then the question that we were expecting this whole time, ladies, who are the paintings in the background? <laughs> <laughs> well, this gentleman is a, a, uh, a husband of Septima Sexta. I don't mean a husband, her husband. Septima Sexta Middleton Rutledge. This is Henry Rutledge. Um, his father was Edward Rutledge, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and uh, he married Septima when she turned 16 years old, and her father was Arthur Middleton, who was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence, so they did have the distinction of both their fathers being signers. And our other gentleman, this is a new acquisition, and he is not a Middleton, and we don't really know who he is. <laughs> He's, so, he's yeah. a fancy dandy. Yep. We don't know who he is, but he's uh, hanging out with Flat Arthur today. Yep. <laughs> there you go. All right. And one last question here. Um, do you need special training? So we've been talking a little bit about that, but um, tell folks how they can come and be a silver polisher at Middleton Place. What's step one? <laughs> step one, you, um, let's see. Hmm. Volunteer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, ha you, have, you, you would have to at least volunteer. Marietta really kind of prefers it to be a staff person just because she can control that a little more. Um, not that she hasn't used volunteers in the past. She just, it, it, it's just a little bit easier with staff. Um, and then, you know, it, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have to talk to Mary Ann about okay. um, the, all, the, the All I know training. is it was a three-day training session, and we, uh, we were taught what to use, how to use it, and then we actually polished 
a a piece of silver and that's how you in front graduate. of her yeah, and you graduate <laughs> that was our graduation and if she approved of course you you then became a certified polisher great and then um so oh somebody would like a reiteration on the pacific silver cloth that is also commercially available yep. correct yes so it's pacific silver cloth and it's it's a brown color yeah and uh yeah amazon um yeah i'm pretty sure i saw it you can google it and it will bring it right up but i'm pretty sure i, I saw it was amazon or something like that google pacific silver cloth it all comes up <laughs> absolutely um well that's great ladies thank you so much do you have anything um in particular that you didn't cover that you'd like to share let's take one more look at when, when I to. first started as a volunteer many years ago, like some 32 years ago, I, I loved the, the silver and I kept referring to it when I was doing tours as I love the polish, the silver, it's beautiful, but I don't want to polish it. <laughs> I what she's 32 doing now. <laughs> years later, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> and I have discovered that I actually love doing this. It, it, it is therapeutic for me and it, it when I'm done, there is a beautiful piece that has been polished. I can see what I've done, and it, it, it is very rewarding. I think um, one of our past silver polishers uh, referred to it as the soothing silver polishing period. <laughs> I can see how that would get a little bit zen. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. zone out a little bit, do mm -hmm. what you got to do. Well, ladies, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. It sounds like everybody is enjoying these educational videos, and we're so grateful that we still get to be here to connect people to the past and to bring you some information about not only um, these wonderful ladies and how they are maintaining our collections today so that you all can come and see them um, either in days past or in days future, um, but also to learn about the individuals who would have been responsible for these pieces for the past several hundred years. So um, we are grateful to get to tell you about both the enslaved and the free here at Middleton Place, and we're just so grateful for your support. So um, I'm going to leave these ladies to it, but thank you. Thank you for joining us. This has been Hands On History Thursday, part of your Plugged Into History programming from Middleton Place, and we are looking forward to bringing you something special on Saturday. Ladies, have you seen the bunny around? I haven't today, but I, I, I've, I've noticed some tracks and things that might be hanging about. Oh my gosh. I, I yeah. saw a, a photo of him on Facebook. Yeah, we're tracking him. I know. Yeah. Well, I you know. all have to let me know if there are any bunny sightings. I'll go out and look for him. Great. So, all right. Thank you all so all right. much. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye for now.